Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another conversation on policing and racist, racism. And today, um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge um, those of us who are behind the scenes on this and creating all of these um, wonderful sessions for us. We'd like to acknowledge the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences and Interim Dean Christina Hasija, Fowl Library, and Thin Lee, Parker Brooks, and Jackie Patterson for their techno technical support for these seminars. Um, at this point, I'd like to go ahead and do the land acknowledgement. We recognize that California State University San Bernardino sits on the territory and ancestral land of the San Manuel Band of Indian Missions, Mission Indians. We recognize that every member of the California State University San Bernardino community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1965. Consistent with our values of community and mm -hmm. diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold California State University San Bernardino more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. So I'd like to introduce our panel today. We have with us today, Stan Fuchs, who's the president of the West Side Action Group. We have Roby Madrigal, who is the communications director of Fowl Library. And we have Mary Texaria, who is a sociology professor emeritus. And I'm gonna pass this on to Jeremy Murray, who is going to introduce our guest today, um, who will be speaking to us today on policing in China. Thank you very much. Thanks, Cecilia. And uh, just to quickly introduce Cecilia, she's uh, both a BA and MA graduate of CSUSB, MA in history. Um, so we're very grateful uh, to Cecilia Smith for joining us as well. Um, I'll briefly, briefly introduce uh, our guest and then we'll have time for, uh, after initial remarks, we'll have time for some questions. So please feel free to type any, any questions or comments into the Q&A section. Dr. Suzanne Scoggins received her BA from University of Georgia, her Master of International and Public Affairs from the University of Hong Kong and her PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, she is today at, uh, a professor at Clark University she researches policing and state legitimacy in reform era China. And her first book that we'll be hearing about today is Policing China, Street Level Cops in the Shadow of Protest from Cornell University Press in the Columbia Weatherhead series. And I'll share a link uh, to that book and you should get your hands on it. I've been enjoying it this past week. It's a really outstanding book. Um, it examines the paradox of China's self-projection of a strong security state while having a weak police bureaucracy. Professor Scoggins' uh, academic articles have appeared in Comparative Politics, the China Quarterly, the Journal of Chinese Political Science, among others. Her research and commentary on policing and Chinese politics have also appeared in outlets such as The Economist, South China Morning Post, New York Times, and East Asia Forum. Her teaching uh, includes uh, courses on Chinese politics, research methods, comparative politics, and social movements. And she's currently a public intellectual pro uh, program fellow at the NCUSCR, the National Committee on US-China Relations. Um, and she's a Wilson China Fellow at the Wilson Center in Washington, DC, which is how I learned about uh, Suzanne's work. Um, I'll also say, uh, uh, share a link to uh, Dr. Scoggins' uh, uh, faculty profile in the chat as well. So you can click through and find lots more of her, uh, of her other projects there and, and learn a lot more about her work. Uh, but for now, I'll just uh, thank Dr. Scoggins for joining us and I look forward to hearing about the book. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you so much uh, to all of you for inviting me uh, to, to come and speak about my book. Um, so I know we've got some different audience members, uh, some people who know about policing, some people who know about China, um, many of you are undergrads. Uh, so I really look forward to your questions and, and comments about the book, which uh, is called Police in China, street level cops in the shadow of protest. Uh, so the central premise of this book, and some of you may have been watching the Party Congress as it's unfolding, uh, and you'll see this, this, this projection of a strong state, right? And so China has been projecting this strong security state for a long time. 
But what I find in the book is that most of that projection is about security and protest control, not about other aspects of policing that are actually, you know, important to what, I, what we call force of capacity. So when you dig a little bit deeper into this uh, police bureaucracy in China, you find that it's actually a really fragmented system and it's quite weak. And the police force as a result ends up being ho really hollowed out and struggling to deal with most types of crime that are outside of protest. So this is an issue for a lot of different reasons. It's an issue for the state, right? It's an issue for security on the ground. Um, it's also calling into question prior beliefs about uh, things like authoritarian resilience and the, the strength of the Chinese state. Uh, and ultimately what matters for people in China is that this poor policing could erode perceptions of state legitimacy. So I wanna start with the acknowledgement that there are different sides to policing in China, right? There are different sides to policing everywhere. And, and perhaps as I'm talking, especially for, for those of you who are most familiar with policing in the United States, you'll, you'll see parallels to, to, to what we experience here in the US. But in China, a lot of experts are talking, let's see. Can I go? Uh oh, it's not gonna let me do my slides. Let's see, we're gonna go this way. Hold on. It's locked. Okay, I'm gonna have to do it this way. So a lot of the um, a lot of the the literature on policing in China, a lot of the the news that we see is really about protest control. But when when I say police in China, a lot of different things may come to mind for you all. One thing that might come to mind is the Tiananmen Square protest, right? Which was mostly the People's Liberation Army, but also the, the, the other security forces like the Public Security Bureau. Um, some of you may also be aware of what's happening in Xinjiang right now with the cultural genocide that's unfolding and the detentions of the Uyghur minority group. And so that is the, that is the sort of strong coercive arm of the state. But of course, that's not what China wants us to think about, right? When you talk to government officials, when you look at sort of the official account, policing looks more like this, right? It's China and ruled by law, um, a very organized, very uh, well-resourced and financed state. Some of you may be familiar with the surveillance cameras. There have been a lot of articles about that. Uh, China would also like to think about you, to think, would like people to think about the police as being friendly, right? And so they have invested a lot of money in these uh, cartoon images of police to try to present a softer side of the state. That's not the story that I'm telling in this book. The, the story that I'm telling in this book is about policing on the front lines. Um, and here we see police officers who are really working under uh, difficult conditions. So they are uh, underpaid, they're poorly trained, and they're finding themselves in dangerous situations without a lot of support. And as you can imagine, police officers who don't have a lot of support will often resort to things like corruption and violence and, and all sorts of misconduct that, that we you know, typically as civilians do not want to see from police officers. And the weakness in the police bureaucracy that I observed in my interviews was really interesting for me and really went against a lot of my priors because I knew that the police didn't have a whole lot of funding, but I also knew that crime rates were low. And so I expected to see a lot of innovation in policing and a lot of sort of working around, like finding workaround solutions. But when I talked to police officers, they told me again and again, we just don't have time, we don't have resources, we're not doing a good, good job. In fact, we're doing a terrible job. And so this really flies in the face of, of how we think about policing in China and surveillance and sort of the big brother state. And I wanted to know more about that. And so I went out and I talked to officers and, and tried to, to understand what, what their constraints were and what their experiences were and, and what they might be willing to say about things like corruption and hardship and, and, um, and, and difficulties in getting the job. So I wanna say just a little bit about my methodology and, and what I did. Um, I conducted 112 in-depth interviews with about 56 officers at three different levels of government. So the local level, the provincial level and the central level. 
Now, policing in China is not decentralized like it is in the United States. It's a centralized system. Everything's governed by the Ministry of Public Security, and that's a very top-down process. So the Ministry of Public Security in Beijing, they set all the laws, and then the provincial ministries, they are, are helping to you know, monitor and to, to to uh, make sure that local governments and local, local local police are following those laws. And then the local police are the actual frontline agents who are um, implementing everything that they're supposed to. So this work was done in eight cities across China over about a 10 year period. Most of the research was conducted in 2012, um, but then I, I was doing field work trips in 2015 and again in 2019. Uh, and then I triangulated, or just trying to understand, you know, not just talk to police officers, but also look at other sources. I triangulated this data with news articles and budget reports and analysis of, of ministry documents to try to just, just corroborate the story that they were telling me. Um, now, what's really interesting and what some of you are probably aware of is that China has closed down uh, to foreigners, essentially to, to, to most foreigners since the COVID-19 pandemic. And even before then, as Xi Jinping was becoming, you know, sort of more powerful and exerting more influence, it's become harder and harder for researchers to do this kind of research. So I didn't know it at the time, but actually this was sort of a golden period of research in China. And, you know, I would say that this type of research where, you know, me as a foreigner, as a white woman going in, um, asking police officers questions, I wouldn't have the kind of access today that I would uh, back when I, when I did the research. They would just, um, I'm not even sure that they would give me a visa any longer. And so this is really a, a snapshot in time and it's uh, important to acknowledge that and think about, you know, as, as uh, maybe some of you are interested in, in China and studying China, like these are some of the resource research constraints that we're facing right now. So that's the methodology. I really strongly feel that the story that I'm telling could not have been, I, I couldn't have figured it out without actually going out and talking to police officers. Some of the problems are it, like, you can see evidence of it online, but it's not systematic. Uh, it's not clear. And it really does take sitting down with someone and talking to them to understand the complexities of their job and the, the, the difficulties that they're facing. And, and hear the stories, right, that, that they tell about, you know, police officer misconduct and, and how rules and regulations are. So that's the background. Let me tell you just a little bit more. This, this is a whole book, right? I don't have all the time in the world to tell you everything about it. But um, the, the interviews uncovered a lot of information. I'm gonna focus on, on basically one aspect of that and that's how does the ministry control the local police? And, and specifically, what are those patterns of control and what does that mean for policing on the ground and what does that mean for civilians? Uh, so I, I break this down in terms of what I, the, a word I'll use, which is stability maintenance. And we can just think of that as protest control, right? Like that's anything that has to do with riots or protests or dissidents and what I call everyday policing, which is, you know, things like responding to theft, responding to car accidents, responding to other types of violent crime, you know, murders and rapes and domestic violence. Um, and the question is, how does the ministry control all of these issues? And specifically, I asked this one very critical question that came up early in my research. Why are the police doing a good job? And here I, I put good in quotation marks because good by their standards, right? Good job at managing protest means putting down protest, silencing voices, right? Well, this is in the perspective of the state, not in the perspective of the, the protesters. Why are they able to, to do an effective job at managing protests, but struggle with all these other types of crime? And it was really a question that I didn't know the answer to. I thought that, that you know, maybe it had to do with resources, but then I went to rich places and they were still struggling. They still weren't paying their officers. I went to poor places. Uh, they were having the same problems as, as the richer cities. And so I really wanted to, to understand this. And it basically comes down to the issue of the state prioritizing protest control at the expense of everything else. And so this is a, this is a strategy of regime survival, right? Because you can't underestimate the shock of, of the aftermath of Tiananmen Square. In 1989, 
when the, the students and the workers, you know, met the met with PLA um, army, uh, you know, tanks and and soldiers on Tiananmen Square, uh, that just alerted the regime to the fact that the party might end, right? That the Communist Party might might not be able to survive. And so they started to preference regime survival in the form of putting down protest over everything else. And it's led to all these other consequences that are really important for how policing gets experienced. And so what I found in my research was basically there are three different ways that they control the police. And they do it according to different types of crime. So there's centralized control, there's shared control where they share power with the local governments, and then there's decentralized control. And in terms of effectiveness from the state's perspective, it goes from good to really, really bad. And so I'm just gonna walk you all through what that looks like. So first we have the pattern of centralized control. This is how the police control protests, but nothing else. And the ministry here is gonna be really heavily involved in dictating the protocols. I've been told there's a 3000 page handbook. I haven't been able to get my hands on it, but they, they have a very detailed playbook for how to handle any type of protest from small to large. And the local governments tend to get in line with whatever the ministry wants them to do and what in terms of keeping down protests, because they themselves have been incentivized to make sure that protests are not happening in whatever jurisdiction they have. So in their city, their province, their, their, their village, they have been incentivized to make sure that they're not any acts of protest. And they've been trying to hide some of that protest too. If they don't do that, then there's this system called the cadre evaluation system and they're gonna get points and eventually they may get, um, they may get, they may lose their job. Uh, they may get demoted. Uh, they could even be, uh, ha have some sort of other repercussion from that. Uh, so the local governments are in line. The ministry is, is exerting a lot of control and the result for policing is that the police know what to do. So let me show you in a couple of different ways what that looks like. The first way that looks, you think about a really small event, right? Or the potential, not even an event, but the potential for an event. So here I've got a quote. I know people can't really listen to people talking and, and also read things. So I'm just going to read the quote to you so, so that there's, you, you don't get confused. Um, here's a police officer saying, during sensitive times, we take very good care of the dissidents. We have rooms or we'll rent a hotel. We buy them food, we let them watch movies, we keep them for a few days. And so what he's talking about, that what's a sensitive time? It's like something like the party Congress that's happening right now. So they actually just figure out sort of who are the people who've been petitioning and then we're gonna go and get them and then we're gonna take them to a hotel, sometimes to the station, but usually to a hotel and we're gonna treat them pretty nice. Uh, sometimes the officer said they would drink beer with them or get them cigarettes, but we're still gonna, restrict their civil liberties. We're not going to let them run free because we don't know what they might do during this time. They might cause trouble. And so it's the protocol here for the police officers. It's very clear, right? You figure out who the quote unquote troublemakers are. You go get them, you detain them, you keep them as happy as you can or as happy as you want to. This is, again, this is a self-reported description, right? So we don't know what everyone's experience is. My guess is that some of these people get, 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 you know, beat up or hurt during these times, but the police officers have not admitted to that in interviews with me. Um, the point is here that, that, that that's how they handle it, right? It's very clear, they know what they're gonna do and they do it. But what about a protest? So that's a small sort of non-event. Here's a, here's a different kind of protest, right? So this is, this is a protest, this is actually a photograph that I took. Um, in Guizhou province, which is now a long time ago in 2007. And the villagers here were, um, they had helped to fix this road and they hadn't been paid. And so they had rolled logs out to, to stop the to stop the cars from moving until they could get some sort of um, some sort of concession from the local government. And so the police are there, the local government officials are there, and this is a village, so these are not local police. They've, they've come from they've come from the nearest jurisdiction. They don't have police down at, at the village level in China. Uh, and here the protocols are also pretty clear. So the, the goals of the police are to get those people off the street. Right, you got to stop them from obstructing traffic. You got to get them into a room. You got to get them out of sight. You've got to start negotiating with them and pay them money 
or put people in jail. If people get violent, right? And getting them out of sight also helps with, with any sort of coercion that might be taking place. So the, the protocols and, and keeps, you know, people from making a record of that. Uh, oh, it's harder with, with cell phones, of course, but you can also confiscate cell phones, but it's a lot harder when you've got people out on the street and, you know, any, any passerbys. So again, here the protocol is really clear, right? They, 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 they have this very large handbook that tells them what to do in a, in a relatively small protest. And this is what most of the protests in China look like. You also have these big events, right? What we call a riot. And this one is from the anti-Japanese riot in Hunan in, in 2012. And so that's a, that's a Japanese car, they're attacking it. And you see that traffic officer with his hands out. Now, the interesting thing about police in China is that most of them don't carry firearms. So they might have a baton, but the vast majority of police since 1995 have not carried weapons. And so this traffic officer has a water bottle in his hand, right? He does not have a gun in his hand. He has a water bottle in his hand. Uh, so you would think he's very ill-equipped to, to handle any sort of riot that, 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 um, that might get out of control. Uh, and the fact is that, that, that he is. And, and so what's happening in this picture that you can't see is that a different police force is on the way and that's called the People's Armed Police. And that used to be part of the Ministry of Public Security but now it's part of the army. And those officers are a completely different type of force. Uh, this is a very well-coordinated relationship. Police officers, local police are able to contact the PAP when something like this happens. And they're going to be arriving. This is in Changsha. So they're going to be there really fast. Their base is very close to, to where this protest is, where this, you know, whatever you want to call it, a riot is unfolding. That's what they would call it in China. Um, they're traveling in squads of uh, always men, uh, up to 500 people. And they're exceptionally well armed. And uh, they are not afraid to, to, to get very violent very quickly. So they, uh, I, I've interviewed a number of these officers, and what's interesting about them is they don't do anything but sit around and wait all day long for something like this. So they don't have another job. They don't have another function. What they, are, what they exist for is specifically to put down any sort of protest that gets violent. And they end up, you know, running laps and working out and doing push-ups and engaging in drills all day long just to handle events like this. And this is strictly, even though they're part of the army, they are not to be deployed. This is strictly a domestic force, similar to the SWAT teams. So they are the, the sort of strongest, fiercest arm of policing in China. And, um, and they've been deployed a lot and they, they, um, they end up putting down protests very quickly. And so this is that regime survival uh, outgrowth. Right. This is this is really where where you can see it most clearly. And this is what happens under centralized control. So, you know, I've got a little cheat sheet here. The example is control of social unrest. How's the ministry involved? Well, they're active. They're well resourced. And the result for crime management from the perspective of the state is that it is successful. That's not the case for everything. Right, that's only for protests. So for something like uh, drug control, it's different. And here I say that the pattern is shared control because the police get governed. What, what they say is they have two bosses. They have the Ministry of Public Security, which is funding their training and their infrastructure. They're funding the, the construction of, say, police stations. But it's actually the local governments that pay their salaries, and they often pick the local police leader. So whoever's the station chief often gets picked by the local government. And they're sharing control over anything that might be seen as medium priority. So uh, this might be drug control. Uh, in most places, it is, is, it is drug control. It's also human trafficking. And these are really issues that are important, but they're not so important that the ministry musters the kind of resources that it did for protest control. And uh, the results for, for crime management here are really mixed, right? Because oftentimes there's conflict between what the ministry wants and what the local government wants. Uh, one place that this plays out is actually in the karaoke clubs. Uh, so here I have a quote from an officer. He says, the local government has a relationship with KTV bars, 
when our provincial ministry intervenes, our job is very difficult. But what he's saying here is that the local government may have ties, sometimes good ties, sometimes corrupt ties to the drug trade and what's happening. And so there's pressure on police officers to make sure that certain people get arrested and certain people don't get arrested. The ministry is trying to often break those ties and it's very difficult to, to, to do that, but they can when they send a mission down. And, and here's where that conflict is because the officers don't quite know what to do. If they don't do what the ministry says, then they may get in trouble, they may get fired. But if they don't do what the local government says, they may also get in trouble and get fired. Sorry, Suzanne, sorry, so sorry to interrupt. Um, I just wanted to note, I think there might be a paper or a page or something on your mic. It, it, I don't know if every now and then we get a, we get a loud rustling on our end. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry, sorry. There it is, that's it right there. That's, that's maybe better. I'll try that. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Great. Thank you so much. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Oh, so, so what the police are doing, the local police are doing is they're trying to figure out how do they manage these two bosses? How do they, do they, they, they thread this needle in a way that doesn't get them fired that enables. Sorry, it's still so sorry. It's oh. still there. Yeah. It's, there's something going on. It just happened again. All the way down. Okay. How's that? Yes. I think, I think that's got it. I'm right. sorry, I'm not sure what it was. But... All right, thank you. Okay, all right. So they're dealing with these two bosses um, and they're, they're, they're really trying to, like I said, to thread that needle and, and just not get fired. Uh, and it, it can put a lot of pressure on these officers. Um, I've got one more, let's see if I can do that. Oh, no, one more slide there. So the, here's a slide for dealing with the two bosses. Um, and the other problem is, even if there's not corruption at the local level, the, the, the issue that they have is coordination. And the, here's a quote from a local officer. He says, the drug problem is getting out of control in his area. He says, they don't have the authority to stop the drugs from coming in. There's no communication between border police and local police, and we don't have enough men to create checkpoints. So what I found is in, in other areas where um, where maybe it wasn't an issue of the two boss situation, they were really having a problem having, having no communication, having no resources to, to, to get drug dogs or to, uh, to even know like when things were changing because they didn't have any communication with the border police or um, anyone in, in the higher levels who might be able to help them understand the situation. And so this is, this is one of those uh, issues when, when there's shared control, right? The, the local government is exerting some control and the ministry is exerting another bit of control, but they're not really, they're not really acting in, in uh, any sort of uh, meaningful way that would, would help officers do a better job of trying to figure out uh, how, they could, how they could do a better job of, of, of uh, managing the problems on the ground. And so here I have the examples. Again, this is the little cheat sheet. There's ministry involvement, there's someone active, but there's, there's really poor coordination. Um, and the results for crime management are pretty mixed. So in some places where drugs were a really big problem, officers said that they were doing a terrible job and they were failing and they just didn't have the resources. But in other places where um, it wasn't as big a part of uh, in terms of usage and a part of the, um, the crime that they were managing, uh, they said that actually the, the coordination was going okay, that they, they, they didn't need more resources, that they were fine. Uh, so that's how they handle things that are shared control, things that are sort of these medium priority issues. But the vast majority of other crimes actually fall under this different category of control, this what we call decentralized control. Now, if anybody's read anything about street level bureaucrats and sort of the, the, the benefits of decentralization where you can tailor a local response on the ground, uh, this is not that. This is, this is not that story. Uh, the decentralized control and everything else leads to the poorest outcomes for crime management. Nearly all of my respondents said that when it came to everyday policing, theft, right, violent crime, uh, domestic violence, murders, all of these, these this, this really broad category of crimes where, where much of the police work is, they said that they were doing a terrible job, that they didn't have the training, that they didn't have the resources, and that crime management was failing every single day. 
law. And this is the vast majority of, of the crimes. So I'm going to talk about theft. I'm going to give you some examples of theft, but I want you to keep in mind that this, this applies to so many other categories of crime as well. So the first issue that comes up is training. Here's this officer in Shanxi. He says, we're supposed to have training twice a year, but I haven't been in years. Our officers don't have specific protocols for how to deal with crime. We don't have the deep knowledge of forensics. Anyway, we have no time. So officers time and time again told me they were required to have training, but that the train they either didn't have training or when they did, it was about political ideology. So it was about loyalty to the party, not how to manage their job, which is a fairly you know, unique, we talk about policing being the same everywhere. This is reasonably unique uh, to the Chinese case. Um, they don't have specific protocols. They have no knowledge of forensics. I heard this in, in research site after research site. They're just not being trained on how to, to, to collect evidence. And it shows. Right now, I've got another project where I'm looking at legal advice sites where people are writing in and asking about police. In, in post after post, people are saying the police collected no evidence. There was, you, you know, somebody broke into my house or, you know, somebody murdered my uncle and the police collected no evidence. There was all this stuff. They did nothing, right? They just don't have, they don't have that training. And specifically, they may not have the time. This is the other thing that comes up. Officers in China are required to respond to every single call that comes into their version of 911. And that means they end up answering a lot of calls that they shouldn't actually be answering. So here's an officer in Hebei who's talking about that. He says, I have no time to help when people would help the people when I respond to calls. We have to respond to every call, even if the problem is not our responsibility. People are calling about lost dogs and we have to go out. I had other officers tell me that people would lose their, their, their passwords to their social media accounts and they would call up and they were like, I don't know my QQ you know, number, can you help me? And they have to respond. And what's more is they have to make a report. And so often, so this is that, this is that de facto decentralized control. So often when the police are making reports, they're, they're spending a lot of time meeting those ministry expectations but the value of those reports is very questionable. I had one officer tell me that 80% of what he writes in his reports are false. So it's not even transmitting information up the chain of command that's even accurate. And, and that's problematic. Uh, I'll tell you another story. I think I've got, yeah, I've got enough time. The same officer told me a story about when he first got on the police force, he, he, was, uh, he was called in, there was, a, there was a call into the equivalent of 911 about a brothel. And so he and his partner went out, they drive out to the brothel and he said, as soon as they pulled up, the, uh, the brothel owner starts running. And the police officer tells this story about he, he, he starts running after the brothel owner and it's hot and, and he's sweaty and he runs and he runs and he runs and he just really wants to do a good job. And he catches that brothel owner finally and he brings him back into the station. And he said when he got to the station that his coworkers were laughing at him and making fun of him. And here he thought he had done a good thing, right? That he had caught this, this brothel owner. But, but he was actually being made fun of. And the reason he was being made fun of is because the police are not actually required to stop a crime in action in China. And so because there's nothing you know, that tells them to do that, his, his coworkers would never do that because they don't have the time to do that because they're, they're out there making reports and they're just trying to, 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 to count the beans, right? They're not trying to actually uh, do anything that might be you know, recognized as crime management. Uh, and at the time he told the story and it was, it was funny, you know, he was talking about being out of shape and being sweaty and, you know, you know, being dismayed when his, his, his coworkers didn't find the, um, the actual, uh, when he, when he, when they didn't think that he was like the brave person that he thought they, that, that, that he thought they would say he was, uh, but as I started to do a little bit more research, I realized how dangerous this can be. There was another case uh, a few years later where a young girl, and I talk about this in the book, a young store clerk was murdered in front of two police officers and their cameras, their security cameras, the footage is still available online. You can watch it. I don't recommend it. She's murdered while these police officers stand in the doorway, seemingly helpless, you know, unsure of what they should do. They, at one point, they pick up a plastic stool and they throw it at him and she's, he's stabbing her to death. And um, they don't actually move in and do it. They do have mace, but they don't move in. They don't have guns. Um, they do move in with the mace, 
once he's already, you know, unfortunately killed the, the young clerk and he's turned the, the knife on himself. And so people really got upset about this. There was a, there was a national uproar. Everyone was talking about it. There was an investigation. The Ministry of Public Security came in. You know, these were experienced officers. One of them was actually a, 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 one of the trainers, right? Someone who conducted police training at the local level. And they, the ultimate report said that the officers should keep their jobs and that they had done nothing wrong. And it all goes back to, you know, not having those protocols that require officers to, to intervene when a crime is actually in progress. So I realized after he told this sort of funny story that there, there, there are real consequences for people um, if, if the protocols are not sufficiently developed. So this is, this is decentralized control, right? This is, this is what's happening with general theft, with murder, with white collar crime, with violent crimes. The ministry is inactive, but it's present, right? It's requiring those reports. It's requiring them to answer every call and they find a lot of workaround solutions for that, which I can talk about in the Q&A if people are interested. And the results for crime management is that every single officer I talked to said that they're doing a terrible job that they're not helping people, that they're not solving crimes, that they're really just filing reports and they're just trying to get to the end of the day. And um, there's a whole body of, of literature on, on uh, police officers, psychological issues and health issues. Um, the, the, this is really a, a, a body of literature that's in the, the, the Chinese police. And so Chinese academics who work for police and colleges are writing about the health effects of, of what this job is doing to them. Um, and the, they're just not getting that support from the ministry that they are for, for things like, when it's centralized control for things like protest control. It just has not been prioritized. So just to break it down again, the centralized control ends up being effective. The shared control gets mixed when it's decentralized. It's not a street level bureaucrat story. It actually ends up being very effective because the ministry continues to require things like responding to every call and doing training that is ideological in nature and not practical in nature and you know filing all of these reports that may or may not be accurate it ends up being ineffective policing on the ground so what are the effects and you can imagine what that looks right like rightly you can imagine it's uh there there there's so many there's so many effects of this right so it creates uncertainty for officers if it's shared control they don't know who to which boss they should be listening to right they're not quite sure how they're supposed to handle things because the protocols aren't, aren't clear they've limited police officer time because of this emphasis on reports and because of this requirement which they still have not rescinded this requirement that they have to respond to every single call, even if it's somebody who has lost their social media password that normally we would not think a police officer should be involved with. And this creates a lot of enforcement problems on the ground, right? They're not responding to crime. They are relying on confessions, right? The confession is really key. And so you can imagine how that confession gets out there. They're not necessarily asking nicely for that confession. This is where police violence comes into play, right? The frustrations, the overtime, the lack of pay. You know, you've got, a, you've, you've got people are, who are sort of hanging by a string. And while my, many of my interviewees were not willing to talk about violence, I know from other areas of research that I'm doing right now on uh, you know, police violence, particularly from, from you know, citizen reports that come up in these legal advice sites that I'm looking at. The police are being violent. They are using force to extract confessions. And that is being, you know, not necessarily created, but certainly exacerbated by this situation, the way that the, 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 the system, the way the system is exerting pressure on them. And ultimately, Obviously, that's going to hurt the relationship with the public. That's going to hurt perceptions of legitimacy, of local state legitimacy, of police legitimacy, and maybe ultimately of regime legitimacy. We know that from Latin America studies that when, when crime is not being uh, handled effectively, people, people change their preferences for regime type. People actually want um, in survey research have been shown to want more authoritarian leaders who will actually, who, who promise to get the situation under control, right? If, if things are not being handled on the ground. China's answer to that so far has been to produce uh, crime statistics that severely underreport crime. But, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is, as people experience uh, crime, they get angry. 
Um, and so that leads me to the last story that I want to tell you. And that's about this um, young girl named Lucia Finn, who was uh, 15, 15 or 16 years old. Um, and she went out with a couple of boys one night and she, she ended up the next morning uh, face down in a river. And uh, the police came and they, they, they found the boys that she was with the night before. They brought them into the station. They questioned them for eight hours. And then they let those boys go. And they said that it was a suicide, that it wasn't a murder. It was a suicide. But the parents came back and they said, those boys, one of those boys is the, the son of a local official. And they said, we, we demand justice for our daughter. And what happened is that 30,000 people joined this riot that you see to, to protest the police and to protest the local government. And you know, many of those people came from her local middle school. They were, they were uh, not just neighbors, but it wasn't 30,000 people that knew Li Shu Fen, right? It was 30,000 people who may have had their own experiences with the police. And when they heard this story about the misconduct, it resonated with them. And so they went to a local government office, they didn't get an answer. And this is a picture outside of the police station. And what they did is they set police officer cars on fire, and then they, they set the police station on fire. And it took the PAP with all their guns and all their other you know, methods of, of, of dealing with protest control, it took them days to get that situation under control. So what we're seeing when police officers are classifying a murder as a suicide, that's that ineffective policing, right? And that's creating a feedback loop causing more protests, causing more problems. And we don't get a lot of information on, on protest events in China. We got a lot of scholars who are working on that. It's very hard to get accurate information, accurate reports, but the Legal Daily, which is a state-run newspaper, actually presented a report in 2012 that said almost a quarter of these mass events were caused by dissatisfaction with police. And so we know that these mass events are being it's, it's, the, the, it's being exacerbated by this poor policing on the, the ground, the, the, the ineffective crime management that we've seen, by the violence and the, the incompetence and the, the stress out officers and the inability to help people. We know that this is, 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 is working together to cause more difficulty and, and to increase that caseload and ultimately undermine the gains you know, that they have been able to secure as a regime. In, in the strategy of protest and poll. So that's the book. Um, I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. I can stop the, I can stop the share. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Um, at this point in, the, um, in these events, uh, generally Stan and Mary join the conversation. We have a couple comments. I have a couple questions um, one that just ties onto what you were just discussing. So if it's okay with Mary and Stan, I'm going to jump in uh, quick and then and then I want to hear from everybody. This is one uh, a question that, and it might also connect it to some of the major themes. Oh, by the way, that was a terrific presentation. I, I really learned a lot. I got a lot of notes of all the notes. Um, but um, I, I'm interested in connecting it to a little bit of the literature surrounding uh, police abolition uh, in this country, but also around the world. Um, in the, 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 the concept that in spite of its seeming dysfunction, there's often uh, the conversation around policing functioning as it is designed and, and this sort of illusion of problems and the need for reform, right, is, is a sort of distraction from the fact that policing is in fact functioning. And we see in this, this country, going back to, of course, um, slavery, Jim Crow, and segregation, we see the ways in which certain kinds of police activity that we would classify as dysfunction today is in fact policing, sort of not just business as usual, but, but actually effective functioning police as they're, as they're designed, right, in terms of maintaining segregation and systems of injustice. And that, um, that, that was going around in my head as I was reading your book, because even in the very recent, relatively short history of the PRC since 1949, we have this tendency to uh, implicate local officials, local, in this case, local police officers, but other local officials when it comes to corruption and things like that. And, you know, the, the, the central government is often off the hook, is often not, not implicated. Um, and there seems to be that trend in stability maintenance where the failing is at the local level, 
all the blame stops at the local level. Um, sometimes a harsh crackdown comes in from the, the ministry, from, from the, the People's Armed Police or another group, and that local, those local actors are either held accountable or they're not, but the blame definitely, the buck stops there, right? The bucks, in terms of blame, the buck stops there. The duties and the, and the loyalties and the obligations go all the way to the top. That is, local officials are, are, are beholden to their superiors, not necessarily to their constituencies. Um, and, and I was wondering how you felt about that idea, right? That idea within the abolition literature about policing functioning as it should, that although these sort of flare-ups, even that very violent flare-up that you, that you cited, if it is successfully contained, you know, like a bomb squad puts a dome over a bomb and detonates it, you know, sort of safely, right? If that, if it is successfully contained, is this not policing at the local level um, functioning as it should uh, because the central regime is not implicated and the ultimate regime legitimacy of Beijing is not implicated? Does that hold any water for you, that idea? Yeah, yeah. So the the one thing that I, do, I talk about in my other research, but not so much here in the talk, is the political role of policing, right? And so the, the Chinese police, they're, they're very open about the fact that they have this political role, that, that polit policing functioning as it should, right? The, the bolstering of the state regime. And I think that the reason why they aren't working with, you know, getting more resources to the local level is because it is functioning the way that the state wants it to function. They are putting down those protests. As long as the PA is strong enough, if they need to up those squads to a thousand men, if they need to do something else, they're going to do it, right? And, and they're banking on that. Uh, but the it's a house of cards, right? It's really a house of cards. And when, when you've got, because what I'm doing now, the, the thing that was missing from the entire book was the perspective of the public. And so what I'm doing now, you know, from a distance is to go in and to, to, to survey people and say, well, you know, how do you really feel, right? Like, what are the, in terms of like all the measures of police legitimacy, right? Or, you know, perceptions of, um, of public safety, right? Like, how, how, how are people responding to things like police propaganda when they see these, uh, when, when they get asked these questions? Um, because that, that's really what matters. I, I, it's, it's, it, it works until it doesn't, right? And so we, we saw this again and again, and we, we almost saw the regime fall in 1989. I think that, that it got reasonably close. Um, you know, is, are these cameras going to be able to keep, because protests have definitely gone down, like the number of protests have definitely gone, gone down. Um, so maybe, maybe we're going to see this just continue on and, and police will, will, will function as it should and not to, um, as the state intends and not as the people intend, right? But there's a there's an undercurrent of dissatisfaction with that. When, when you've got police officers, there was one story where um, somebody reported a theft. This is actually some like a contact, somebody who introduced me to a police officer. They reported a theft and the police officer came and he said, I, there, I can't do anything for you. But if you call back and tell them you reported this by mistake, I'll change your law for free. So he'd switch out that lock for free, right? That's the kind of sort of perverse logic that's going on here. And that didn't leave a good perception of the police in this, in this young woman's head, right? She, she, she did not get her stuff back. Her stuff was lost forever. She got her lock changed because she did call back. But it undermines the, the, the faith, I think, in, in, in local government officials. Um, and that may ultimately have, have problems later on, right? If, if, if there's a riot in the areas, people may be that much more likely to join. But again, as you say, as long as they can, can put it out, maybe it doesn't matter at all for, from the perspective of the central state. Thanks, Suzanne. I'm going to turn over to Mary and, and Stan. I'd like to ask about propaganda if we have time later. Oh, uh, okay, but, I got lots but, of stuff. <laughs> uh, all right, thanks. I was, I'm thinking of Chow Yun-Fat and the Hong Kong shoot 'em up yeah. cop yeah. movies, but yeah. then also the, you know, the, the, the sort of big-eyed, happy sort of emoji cops that you showed there. Sorry, I'll turn it over to Mary and Stan, and if we have time, we can discuss that. That was wonderful, Suzanne, and I'm going to give uh, Stan the floor, uh, but I did want to go back to your methodology. Um, I'm just wondering, number one, how did you get into this particular field? I think we talked a little bit about that before we actually started, 
And number two, do you speak Chinese? How did you get your participants? Um, I know you said you had 112 interview. Well, you had 56, but you, yeah, you must have interviewed them twice or something. Yes. It's so, five times. so yeah. So just snowball or just how, how did you, how did you get, get these yep. folks to, uh, to, to participate and to cooperate? Sure. So, so years ago I worked as an English teacher, um, to police officers. That was when I was learning Chinese, I was trying to make money, trying to like support myself. And, and so I taught English and I just got a gig where I was teaching officers. Um, and so when I got into grad school, I was like, oh, I know police, police officers. I, you know, they were my students. Like we, we, we go way back, you know, they'll talk to me. Um, and it didn't really work out that way. <laughs> <laughs> Because I was in Beijing where things are sensitive. And so most of my students were like, don't you want to study something else? Don't you want to do something else? But I'd already gotten into it. And so I started asking my friends, like, and I almost gave up, honestly. I, I, I went back at one point to my advisors and I was like, I'm just going to do the archives. And I had one advisor who was like, you don't do that. You get back out there. You know, you gotta, you got to figure this out. And so I just asked people, you know, friends that I had made. I was like, do you know? police officers who might be willing to talk to me and so that was that snowball right I would talk to someone they would they would help me they would introduce me we would go to dinner um and it's, there were some officers who were just so excited to tell their story right who were because there are a lot of people who just want and I think most people in general not just a lot of people I think most people are excited to tell you how difficult their job is right and how hard they're working and how much you know you know all the issues like they're because because nobody else will listen to them and so I was that person who would listen to them even though I'm coming from a completely different background right you're coming in as a white woman a white American woman uh, who was a researcher, not a police officer. Uh, there were certain interviewees who were just so excited to open up and tell their story and tell me stories that, that it was like I had known them my whole life when we sat down. And then there were other officers who I could be their next door neighbor. Our kids could go to the same school. We could do, you know, we could play mahjong every Friday night and they would never tell me anything, right? They're just, they're, they're different types of interviews that ease in this world and I came across a bunch of them. Um, I will say that coming in as a foreigner, uh, it was, it, it almost worked in my favor in a lot of cases because I was this safe person. I wasn't going to report them. Nobody was going to listen to me. I was just this sort of sounding board. And so sometimes that worked in my favor where people were willing to talk to me, but it took two years. It really, it took two years of going back. And for the first, I forget how many months, I, I got nothing. I mean, I did like three interviews and got nothing, got yeah. nowhere. Mm -hmm. And then right toward the end of field work, things just sort of exploded and people were like, yeah, come back and we'll talk to you about this, right? And it was, it was right as Xi Jinping was taking power. Right. So well, some of it has to do with being, you know, persistent. Yeah. Some of it being yeah. at the right place at the right mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. um, and just having, you know, having the, the, the resources to keep at it, right? Mm -hmm. I, was, I was lucky to so. get funding for this project. <clears throat> To have people who believe that I could actually go out and do it. Before I get to the questions, I, I have one of my own. You know, in America, we do nothing but uh, SOPs, MOUs, mm -hmm. standard operating procedures, um, and, and and so we all, we know what our standard operating procedure is. Memorandum of understanding. We know what our memorandum of understanding is. So we use those two items in our daily job. It sounds like, and, and when we see our books on those two subjects matters, they're about this thick. I mean, they're, they're big books with a lot of information in them. It sounds to me that they've de decided that they're gonna give them a pamphlet of SOPs. And as long as you follow this pamphlet of SOPs as opposed to this large book of SOPs, you're doing your job. And as long as you're doing your job, you're gonna keep your job. Is that what, is that how you, you saw it or am I wrong? Yeah, you know, somewhere, out, maybe not on this shelf, but somewhere I've got the book. It's pretty thin. It's pretty thin. It's not quite a pamphlet, but it's pretty thin. And there's a lot of things that don't get in there, right? Like, like the illegal blood trade, just not regulated. 
just not in there. So it's just going on down in the subway in one of the cities where I did research, just trading blood, you know, nothing good about that from a public health perspective, that there's nothing on it. So the police won't touch it unless there's, unless they're going to be evaluated on it, they're not going to touch it. And part of this is because the police bureaucracy was decimated during the cultural revolution during the sixties and seventies, right? Just completely fell apart. Nobody could do their job. They, they, they just, they, they, they just walked away from it because the Red Guards were coming after them and they just didn't want to, they didn't want to get hurt. And so they basically disbanded during that time. And then from 1978, December 1978 onward, they had to rebuild that organization. And they've been working at it. You know, it's the 1995 police law. They keep, they keep amending it. Um, they keep trying to build out those rules and regulations. But the fact of the matter is you need a book that is this thick, right? You need that. And you need training that tells people what to do, right? That doesn't just say, okay, you, this, this training session is about loyalty to the party. If, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna expect them to implement those laws. Now, not all of those laws may be good laws, right? Like that's the other thing. And so this is the kind of like build out that they've had for protest control that they're not having for other things. Well, um, so, so I'm gonna get some questions. It says, there were reports that the police recruited street gangs in the uh, HK protest that uh, garnered media attention in about uh, 2021. Is that verified or not? Uh, so I, I haven't seen it like officially verified. It's extraordinarily hard to verify. Uh, one way that you can kind of tell uh, that, that, okay, so one of the things that they do, they, they have a limit on how many and this is policing in mainland China. So policing in mainland China is different than policing in, in Hong Kong uh, because the, Hong Kong comes up under the British system, but there's a lot of influence now between the mainland Chinese police and what's happening in Hong Kong. But in China, in mainland China, they hire these, these temporary, what they call auxiliary police officers to come in and do all sorts of things like direct traffic and do dirty work and, and um, detain dissidents and to beat people up. And so there's a long history of this. There's a really good book called Outsourcing Repression. Uh, Lynette Ong just wrote that book. It's called Outsourcing, uh, uh, <laughs> Outsourcing Repression. And her last name is O. She talks about these hired thugs. So I, I believe that these were we, these were hired individuals to come in and do that work because those it's 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 plausible deniability. You bring in these people, they do their thing, and then like, oh, we didn't do that. We don't have them on the books, right? We, they, they, this is not these these were not our people. We don't know who those people were. They might have been protesters trying to, you know, stir things up. So, so the answer is I, I can't say for sure, but it happens in the mainland, and it's likely that it happened in Hong Kong. And so on the same subject, there's a question and, and pretty much how do they control organized crime? So a lot of it is, is where this shared control comes into play. Right? So anything, and again, it depends on the location. In some places, it's a problem. In some places, it's not. In, in the South, it tends to be more prevalent. And a lot of the organized crime leaders have ties to the local governments and ties by, because the local governments are choosing the local police officers, they have ties, the local police station leader, they have ties to the local police. And so those bonds are really hard to break, but they're also really hard to research. Um, and, and there's a, another book, I'm gonna just do everyone's book here, but there's a book called The Red Mafia and Peng Wong writes about this. He writes about it in Chengdu. And he's, he's so great in his method section because he talks about all the things he wanted to do and then what he did and then what he couldn't do, right? And so it's just a very difficult, it's a very difficult link to make. And even in my research with, with all the, the time that I spent and, and you know some of these police officers, I knew way back before I started my graduate work, um, talking about corruption is really hard. People don't wanna talk about corruption. They'll tell you just a little bit uh, but and talking about something like mafia ties is even more difficult. So yeah. it's there, but it's it, it, it's hard to quantify. So now one of the questions was um, why you were doing your research and so on, and and because of, of what you found, did you feel safe in the country? Is this being this is not being broadcast, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. It, uh, was that facetious or? Uh... No, I mean, but it, it's it's out there. Okay, so so. You know, 
I, so I won't get into to, to, to nitty nitty gritty details, but but you know, at times I was scared. Yeah, at times I was scared. I um, I don't know why. I've never been brought in. They could have brought me in at any time. I, I wonder if it's because people kind of knew what I was doing, right? I was I was like sort of system adjacent as opposed to like out there doing something else, you know, in the sphere. Um, you know, I've worried about being questioned. I, I, I once went, my last field trip uh, that I went on, I was a um, field, field work trip, not field trip, but the field work trip. I, I, was, um, I was five months pregnant, right? And crossing the border and going into this, I, you know, I didn't know if, if, I didn't really want to be detained. I didn't really want to be asked questions. I just wanted to, to, to talk to my contacts and, and, and get out of there. Um, you know, this is the kind of stuff, like I, I don't, There'll be researchers who go back to China next year, right? That this is this going to open back up. But I think people who do this kind of research, I, I don't think we're going to be going back to China next year. I, I don't think that there's a space for this. this so year. I've read several of the questions, but I'm putting, I'm trying to put it in in one question, and that is, is crime? You should say, is violent crime low? This is a good question. So by all accounts, violent crime is very low in China. China is very safe. It's a wonderfully safe. You can walk out at night. You're perfectly fine. Uh, there's another researcher and, and you know, his, his, his accounts are good in Southern China. He finds that crime has been systematically underreported, that it's much, much higher than they say it is. And, and I, was, I would assume, my dad was in Thailand and, mm -hmm. and some guy owed him Twenty dollars, and he was sitting in a bar talking to another guy, and the guy said, "I'll kill him for ten. And so, people disappear. And is what my question is: is so, although the crime number is low, you don't really know what the crime number is because people could disappear. And there's so many people they could disappear, and 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 if they file a complaint, they're afraid they might get in trouble also, right? Yeah, and, and you know, detentions are common and, and when people get detained, the families don't have to be notified. They can stay in detention for as long as they want to keep them in there. So, you know, people, if, if there's someone involved, um, that is, that, that does happen. Now, in terms of the murders, uh, it's really interesting. The, the, the murder rate was, uh, I forget what year it was, but they said the murder rate has to go down. And lo and behold, the, the economist wrote about this. I think it's called Murder Mystery Solved or something. You can look it up. <laughs> and the murder rates went down. They went down right after. They did a whole thing. It went right back down to where it was in 1980. And uh, that's not right. There were no extra resources. There was no additional training. Like, you know, it, it used to be that, that people would say, like criminologists would say, you can't hide a body, right? Like when, when there's a body, the, there's a crime, uh, but there are lots of ways to hide a body, and and you know you can classify like that story I told. You can classify it as a suicide, right? You can you can find another way around it. Someone could have been disappeared. The, they made those murder rates go down and the clearance rates go up to a hundred percent. They did that very uh, very quickly and without the resources. And so the suspicion is there that, that this mm -hmm. is just not accurate. And and what I thought when I first went in, I thought that somewhere there were real crime statistics. So I was convinced that I could get my hands on real crime statistics. And as I mm -hmm. talked to people, I realized they're not real crime statistics because that would make every that would make everything fall down, right? Mm -hmm. Because everyone's in on it. And this is what. Um, the scholar Xu Jianhua, what he writes about in his book on crime statistics, his, his, um, his article on crime statistics, is everybody's in on the game. It, it helps the station, it helps the police officer, it helps the station, it helps the city, it helps the province, and it helps the country if the crime rates are underreported. And so it's just a systematic process of, of keeping things low. So we don't really know is the, the short answer of crime. It's okay, not, that, so to follow that up, are there prisons empty or are their prisons full the prisons are full as far as we don't know <laughs> but it's low crime rate but prisons are full prisons are full now not 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 the incarceration rates of the united states but the incarceration rates are pretty high and they're 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 just it, it's so hard because these the they're they're not required to report on it right when even family members don't know where their family member when even you know, families don't know where their family member is. Um, there's just a lot of ambiguity there. You've got, you know, facilities that, that we don't have any access to, 
we simply don't. And you know, it like, like what what's happening out in Xinjiang with the Uyghurs? Like they're just making the best guess based on the size of the building. We have no idea how many people are detained in Xinjiang. You know, so I'm not I, I think, to, to Jeremy because I'm interested in seeing hearing about the propaganda also. So can, uh, can I can I? Oh, go ahead, Mary. Um, elbow my way in here. Um, sure, yeah. Suzanne, I think, you know, you and I talked off camera about, um, you know, the differences in domestic policing versus Chinese policing and everything that you have said, we have had examples in this series. It may not be as widespread, but there are examples of police uh, and police departments repressing um, crime statistics. There are examples of police acting as thugs at, uh, at peaceful protests and that kind of thing. So uh, I had suggested that maybe there's not that much of a difference. I'm not sure that we're at the level of the Chinese, but I, I do believe that it is a cautionary tale that you have just told about, uh, about you know, what we have to look forward to uh, in terms, uh, you know, as, as our society gets more and more repressed. But my colleague, uh, Mike Chow asked, if local policing is ineffective, what effect has um, this had on organized crime in the form of street gangs and street justice? Yeah, so this is really interesting. This is where we, we just don't have the data on it, right? Like this is- this Yeah, is yeah. It's extraordinarily hard to research. Yeah. Um, it, it just you just can't get to it. Yeah. Um, is but, is there evidence of street gangs? So there there definitely definitely in the south there's evidence of street gangs. Um, there's evidence of you, you know what what um, what Peng Wang calls the, the the red mafia, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of co-opting, right? The Chinese state is really good at co-opting sort of forces, and so trying to to bring them in in some sort of uneasy partnership is is mm -hmm. is you know my suspicion for why things don't completely get out of hand and mm -hmm. actually. Um, you know, again, I, I don't do research on this, but but Lynette Ong in the book that I mentioned, uh, she talks about the importance of of not co-opting people who are too powerful, right? So not bringing them, not paying members who are too powerful because then they could eventually take over the police. Mm -hmm. So there may be like a delicate way of, of managing uh, organized crime at, with, with different levels of organization. Uh, but again, like no scholar has been able to, 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 to crack this yet. And it wasn't something that came up in my own. I, um, I've got some of these questions and I might follow up with Suzanne if she has time by email, but I did want to jump in before we wrap with it with a propaganda question because I would just love to read an article by you, hint, hint, about cops on film. And we, we've got some, we had some folks in here, Howard Henderson and uh, uh, Franklin Wilson in from Texas of uh, almost two years ago now. And I want to have them back talking about propaganda um, and Alec Karakatsanis was on The Daily Show uh, a few weeks ago talking about uh, a propaganda as well. And it's a big thing that he talks about. And I, I'm interested in this. I, I, I know there's such a, such, such a spectrum of police roles and the sort of wedding cake of, of kind of accountability. Um, but there's, there's the Hong Kong context, of course, those fun, fun I guess, Chow Yun-Fat style detective shoot 'em ups where there's just a lot of a lot of people getting shot uh and and the cops always solve the crime of course um and they're they're sort of somber kind of serious films um but again the sort of hyper competent cop and we get a lot of that we get uh, john oliver talked about that in law and order uh a couple of weeks ago as well um the sort of hyper competence of police that we get from hollywood that we know obviously if you just scratch the surface is just not true um, but there, so, so there's that side of it, but the Hong Kong context is very different, right? They, I don't think PRC would want to project the sort of gritty Chow Yun Fat or, you know, Denzel Washington and training day kind of cop that, that uh, are you seeing any of that? I, I'm also thinking of like, do you know the story of Cho Ju, the, the Zhang Yimou film? At the end of it, the cops come. It's it's a terrific thing. The cops come in at the very end and they mess it all up. Like the, the there's a happy ending and then in come the cops as this sort of coda and they they make a mess of it. Um, and and but that's a small film, but there there are sort of bigger films that we can 
we can talk about, but I would just love for on the foundation of this work to hear about your view of in the mainland cops on film and popular projections. You talk a little bit about social media efforts and, and a pretty savvy kind of attempt to, to do that. Um, but anyway, it's sort of open question. I was wondering if you, if you had some thoughts about that, whether they're bringing on any of the gritty Hong Kong shoot 'em ups there's so, Wolf Warrior, but sorry. Okay, go ahead. No, it's, it's really crazy. So I spend a lot of time on Douyin, which is uh, what they call TikTok in China, which, you know, it's a Chinese uh, app. Uh, I've got a big project on this right now, uh, classifying the different types of propaganda that they're producing. Uh, some of it is that nitty gritty, like here's the cop doing his thing. Uh, some of it is very humorous. Some of it is, um, look how hard this police officer is working. He's like, his wife just gave birth and, you know, he's out here stopping crime. Uh, some of it is, you know, just like super hyper um, uh, produced, right? And so they, they, they're, they're, they're trying every sort of form of propaganda you can on TikTok. And it's, it's really effective, I think. So I, I ran a survey, I'm trying to, 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 to I ran a pilot, I'm gonna run the big survey soon to see like which type is more effective. Um, but they're doing it everywhere. There's, there's a police training camp, it's a reality TV show where they show how strong and wonderful they are. Um, it, there are all the TikTok things, there's everything on social media, you know, other types of social media. There's even, I've got a project coming up that I'm so excited about. There's even stand-up comedy. So cops doing stand-up in Shanghai who've been brought in. And uh, I got some access to, to some, some government procurement uh, notices, right? So police are actually putting out notices of, uh, you know, soliciting help for TikTok, for, 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 for Douyin. Uh, they want public relations help so that they can improve their content. And uh, they get more money, police officers in Southern China. Uh, a friend who's in the field uh, uh, told me that police officers told him they would get more money if they produced on TikTok. So it's, they're, they're, they are simply trying everything they can to present this, what I call the softer side of state control and, and to make this, to make this propaganda. And, and to be honest, I, I think they are pioneering it. I, I, I really think that, that if, if other cops around the world do the same thing, um, it's, it could actually make a difference, right, in terms of, 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 of public perceptions, because they are really, really good at it. And you get through one of these things, you're like, oh, the cops are great. Right? Like, like, look how hard this guy is working, and it 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 can soften some of these these like really nasty things that officers do in the kingdom. That the effects for that could be huge, right? Um, and they're they're trying their best. So we'll see what my survey results says. So the fact, go ahead, Jeremy. I was going to say I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to that, I, but it doesn't seem like so the sort of film industry is behind local police. The way they are in the U.S., with the way the way Hollywood is very definitely behind sheriffs, behind uh, municipal police, um, you know, yeah. as high, even in Scandinavia, right? These 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 wonderful series, right? These hyper competent cops, um, which is just not the case, right? And we don't really see that kind of serious propaganda from the from the Beijing film and television world or Shanghai film and television. They have some, though. They're, they they're do. Working. Okay. Right, so the police training camp, they're they're working on it, and they, remember they have they have final editing control. Oh yeah, of how cops are being portrayed. So even so, something like the Zhang Yimou movie, like you wouldn't see that today, right? The cops wouldn't be able to come in and screw it all up, right? They're yeah, just, right. That's editing that's, on that. You know, there, there's 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 final say from the censors um, that I think is. is Thanks, bad. Suzanne. Sorry, Stan. It's okay. Uh, I I was getting ready to say, um, with the cops responding to everybody's call. What's the attitude of the people about their officers? Are, are they, they like them? They don't like them? They, you know, mixed feelings? Yeah, so this is, this is, this is my big question, right? Because my, my sense is that it, the, the historically, so there, there, there's, um, there are a bunch of criminologists who do a lot of survey research and they've done really good surveys um, and they're finding high levels of trust in the police over and over again. They're, they find variation, but people are reporting higher levels of trust in police. I, I, I'm suspicious about that. You know, the, I, I, I think there's a lot of uh, reporting bias here. 
Um, and they, they, you know, they've done in-person interviews, they've done surveys, you know, online, they've done all sorts of things to try to get at that question. Um, and I think their suspicion is that it's a little bit too high, but overall people are reporting high levels of trust in the police right now. Um, and I'm hopeful that my survey experiment will show some, some differences with the propaganda. Uh, and one so, of the, one of so the with that, pilot is that people, people tend to report more sort of more negative feelings after they view the propaganda than positive. And so I wonder if they're tapping into uh, like a real sentiment there that, that you wouldn't get in a regular. So state. describe some of the uh, corruption then. Um, so, oh, it's, it's really, it, 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 it's, it's really rampant. The, um, the, the, the pain of fines, you know, if, if something happens, you, you, you take a, a chunk of change to the, the, the public security bureau. I mean, that, that's just, that's common knowledge in a lot of cities. Like you're going to have to pay off the victims. You're going to have to give gifts to the officers. Like this is a, this is, this is a standard practice, right? Of, of gift giving. And, um, and sometimes it's in the form of cash and sometimes it's in the form of other things depending on the location. Um, and so if you, if you wanna curry favor, you, you, you gotta do that. And if you don't have that money, then, then you're not. You're well, not thank you so much for coming out. We were, we were all excited about your, your, your coming to this and uh, us stretching out a little bit further than we normally do to hear what's going on in, you know, in policing in China. And uh, Jeremy's asked, you know, I got someone who can give a nice talk on, do we want to go to China? Yes, everyone said yes. So we were all excited about you coming. So I, I want to thank you for coming out and, and, um, and being with us. Uh, Robbie, you have anything? Cassandra, you have anything? Cecilia, Robbie, or will we can? Cecilia, Robbie, I'm sorry, Cecilia. I don't. I just want to say thank you. I, I really, really found it interesting. It's it's not something I normally think about or understand, um, but it's it's super interesting to me. So thank you very much. We appreciate it. Well, thank you, and uh, we appreciate you being here. And hopefully, you can come back again when you've done your next book. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. It was a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Thanks everybody for joining. And we'll have, I'll, I may follow with a couple of your questions that we didn't get time for. Yeah, I'll follow yeah, happy Suzanne to and share, the, share the responses. Thank you so Thank much, you. everybody. Thanks, Suzanne, for joining us. Thank you, students.